Good afternoon. My name is Tim Apicella, and I'd like to introduce a new show. And the new show is called Hawaii Moving Forward. And the show is dedicated to transportation issues. When we say transportation, it's kind of a very generic term. So um, I'd like to kind of define that a little bit further. Um, transportation many times means mobility. And as we all know here in the state of Hawaii, specifically here in Honolulu, mo mobility seems to be quite an issue. And um, we'd like to address that. We'd like to see where we're currently at with our mobility issues. We'd like to see where we can move forward, forward to the future. So without further ado, I'd like to just talk a little bit about what I've done in the past as it pertains to transportation issues. Um, for 17 years, I was a transportation traffic reduction manager in the city of Seattle and um, spent a great part of my life trying to um, make the city of Seattle a livable city. And I'm sure that everyone who might be watching this show or will watch it in the future, I'm thinking that that's an interest to them as well. We, um, the lifeblood of our cities are really mandated about mobility. How do we get into work? How do we get into do our shopping? How do we get out of work? How do we get out of um, our parking lots? And um, I think the city of Honolulu has a lot of, a lot of work to do in the future. And um, I'm thinking that when people think of social issues for whatever reason, uh, transportation and traffic seems to rate very, very high because it impacts our lives. Uh, things seen and things unseen, um, how, how we're impacted by traffic and, and waiting in traffic. So how do we define traffic? Well, basically it's um, people trying to move and we're trying to go to work, we're trying to go to school, we're trying to do our shopping, we're trying to run errands. And unfortunately traffic is at a time when we're all trying to do that at the same time. Um, a lot of times we have to go to businesses that are um, open certain hours. We have to go to work that requires us to be at work at a certain time. So we're all trying to do the same things at the same time. And traffic congestion simply means just waiting in line. We're waiting in line to get down the road. And um, that's the most frustrating part of, of traffic. Um, I moved to Hawaii here about nine years ago. And the um, city of Seattle is very much like uh, Honolulu. We have, um, from a topography standpoint, we have water. And then we have this land strip. And then we have mountains. So based on topography, it's very, very difficult to um, build your way out of, of a traffic problem. And um, so the two cities, in, in many ways, are very similar from, from that standpoint. Uh, currently, about 8.1% um, of peak hour commuters are taking about 60 minutes in traffic to get to uh, their point of destination. And <clears throat> it's, it's, um, it's as high as 75 minutes or longer. And we know that by studies that when people take more than 75 minutes to get into the workplace every morning, day in and day out, um, we find that people try to make changes to their lives. They try to either relocate from where they live closer into the workplace, or they try to um, alter their hours and uh, trying to you know, see if, if the employer will allow them to, to flex their hours. The problem is if you can't afford to move or you can't afford to, uh, afford to move into a location closer to the work site or you have a work schedule that's, that's non-flexible. So from our, our life standpoint, it can be very, very frustrating day in and day out that you have no alternatives to be waiting in line to be stuck in traffic. Um, things here in Hawaii are, are, are very challenging. Um, our roadways are limited. So unlike other cities in, on the mainland in the United States, there may be alternative roads to, to get you to your place of destination. And uh, unfortunately, there's just not a lot of arterial, um, arterial parallel roads that take the pressure off of H1, H2, or H3. Um, we have very short on-ramps, I've noticed. And a lot of times, because of short on-ramps to the freeway, that traffic will back up into the neighborhoods and cause um, further congestion issues for the neighborhood. Um, we have a lot of construction projects going on. Uh, I, think, um, I think I saw recently that the Hawaii Department of Transportation may as, have as many as 800 projects going on in, around the state. And uh, I don't think you have to look very far to see if you live in the, um, you know, the Pearl City area to what extent those traffic projects are, 
excuse me, those construction projects are, are taking effect. Um, we also have out by the uh, Cam Highway is, is always blocked. We have signal synchronization issues. Um, there are, there are uh, projects that are trying to line up those signals so that they work in unison, but there's so many other places that need, need that kind of assistance from the Department of Transportation. We have 15 major condos being built, a lot of them in Kaka'ako area. And um, I can only imagine with all the cranes and all the t cement trucks and all the, the workers that have to show up to the site, just, um, just how tough it is to get in and out of that area. And there's more coming. We have approximately 30,000 students and staff when school's in session trying to get to the University of Hawaii, Manoa. Um, they're coming from everywhere. Um, east, west, um, town. Everyone's trying to get into the University of Hawaii. And then if you add on the, um, if you add on the private schools, that number goes way up from 30,000. So it could even be 35 or, or even higher. So when we look at, when we look at transportation, when we look at traffic congestion, um, there's a quote from a uh, uh, transportation secretary about a decade ago, and his name was Sid Morrison. And um, he was the Washington State uh, Secretary of Transportation. And he, he said something I think applies, whether it be in Seattle, whether it be in Honolulu, New York, Los Angeles, um, whatever city. Um, his, this quote is very poignant, so allow me to read it for a second here. There is no silver bullet solution to the region's transportation woes. The best ammunition is instead silver buckshot. We need a scattergun of solutions attacking the problems with rail, bus, ferries, concrete, and technology, from smart cars to smart roads, from HOV lanes to hot lanes, to telecommuting and rideshare and vans and bikes. So I think what is most appropriate is there is no silver magic bullet. Um, and unfortunately, I think some of the agencies might think that what they do uh, in the state might be the, the answer to our, our, our traffic congestion issues. Um, I'm not saying that's the case, but I've seen it in play elsewhere. Uh, for example, the rail. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people think that that's going to really move a lot of people in and out of the, um, from, from the west to, to town. And that is going to really um, be a silver bullet approach to our tra transportation problems. Um, sometimes the bus organization thinks the same. Uh, here's an example of, of why a silver buckshot approach is, is more important than a silver bullet approach. Let's say the Department of Transportation presumed that they could build their way out of our traffic congestion. And they thought, we'd, all we need to do is add more roads. And by the way, I don't think the DOT believes that for one minute. But in other states, um, they do believe that we can build ourselves out of this, of this congestion issue. So let's just hypothetically pretend that H1 had suddenly, overnight, a new, brand new three-lane, four-lane parallel H1 right next to it. So all the traffic that was on the first H1, or the, the primary H1, um, you would see them go to H, the other H1, and, and the traffic would be reduced. The problem stands that word gets out. If uh, there's new, a new access and there's decreased time in um, commuting, that um, the word gets out to everybody. So for those people who never took H1 to begin, one, begin with, and they took an, uh, um, an alternative route, and for those people who said, well, you know, the worst time to go in H1 is between 7 and 9 in the morning to go to town. I'll just wait. I'll just, I'll just hold off going into work, or I'll hold off on running my errands until later in the morning. So there's a second uh, segment of folks. And then there's the other folks that say, I just, you know, I just can't do it. I can't afford to have a car in the first place. Um, maybe I'll just, you know, I'm, I'm taking transit, or transit actually seems to work best for me. So... Those are the three kind of segments of, of people that weren't using that H1 to begin with. The problem is when the word gets out, people go, oh, there's more capacity on the roadway. You can get into town much faster than you could before. So now I'm going to get on that road uh, with everybody else. 
and it doesn't take long for the second H1 now to fill up as bad as the first H1. Now it may take a year, it may take two years, but sooner or later, um, the increased roadway eventually is going to fill up as bad as the original road that was um, enhanced. So this kind of goes to the point of, is it more roads? Because a lot of people think more roads, if they just built more roads, we would have less traffic. Or a concept which I did for uh, 17 years, which is called transportation demand management. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And what that is, is, well, first off, transportation demand management is more or less a, um, an academia uh, terminology. I, I like the word um, vehicle elimination, and I think that's more descriptive of what you're trying to do. You're trying to, from the destination point where people are coming in, you're trying to persuade people that are coming to that point of destination, be it an employer, be it to the University of Hawaii, wherever, you're trying to convince them that maybe if you leave the car home once a week, twice a week, be great if they could do it five days a week, but start off maybe even with one time a week. And if you can convince people that um, coming in by a carpool or coming in by a van pool or transit, eventually rail, um, that would give you that one trip, that one car that did not get on the H1. That would give you that opportunity where you didn't have to expand your capacity, but rather you got the demand or you reduced that one car. And from a cost standpoint of the use of um, you know, the taxpayer's dollars, the reduction of that one car through persuasion um, is a lot, lot less expensive than trying to add concrete and rebar. So the buckshot approach um, is a good one. We, we just shouldn't focus on any one methodology of trying to reduce our congestion. Uh, looking at Honolulu, um, USA Today, ranks Honolulu number sixth worst, worst traffic in the United States. Um, TomTom Tom lists, uh, let's see, they list LA as number one, San Francisco is number two, uh, Honolulu is number three, New York, and then Seattle following. So that's, that's quite a statement. Uh, I believe that no matter what you do, um, going back to the days where it would take far less to get into town, um, I'm not saying those days are over, but when I um, look at population growth, be it in any city, what maybe the best you can hope for or try to attempt is to keep traffic from getting any worse. And that leads me to our population growth here for Hawaii in the next um, years to come. So currently right now, Honolulu County has 976,000 uh, residents. Um, Kauai has 71,000, Maui 168,000, and uh, Hawaii County at 202,000. So totaling about 1.4 million in 2015. The hard part to, to digest here is that if you look at population growth projections, and just I'm just going to talk about Honolulu County right now, uh, we are looking at an increase of about 67,000 people by the year 2020. We're looking at uh, 94,000 people addition, uh, added to the, to the area by 2025. And if I fast forward to 2040, we're looking probably a, a projected growth of an additional 153,000 people or 1 million, 1.2 million basically. Um, and so what I'd like to do is take a break right here and we'll be right back. I'm Tim Apicella. This is Hawaii Moving Forward. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Stan Energy Man, and I want you to be here every Friday. Noon, thinktechhawaii.com. Watch the show. Be there. I pity the fool who ain't. Please join us at Think Tech Hawaii. My program is Asia in Review. And my next program is on November 17th, Thursday, 11 a.m. This is Johnson Choi, your host. Aloha everyone, I'm Maria Mera and I'm here to invite you to my bilingual show Viva Hawaii on ThinTech Hawaii every other Monday at 3 p.m. We are here to talk about news, issues and events local and around the world. Join me. Aloha. Aloha!
This is Rez McJackal. The University of Hawaii football team under Rolovich is going to get what this season. In case you didn't understand me, University of Hawaii football team is going to kick butt under Rolovich this season. So be sure to follow us on Think Tech Hawaii and Hibachi Top. I'll be at every game. And remember, aloha! Welcome back. I'm Tim Apicella. This is Hawaii Moving Forward. I'd like to talk about where we go from here. What, what are the goals of this program? I would like to have a very informative discussion with guests that will be appearing here shortly. Um, specifically, we want to look at the, the existing problems here that face Hawaii residents. We want to look at how the impact of traffic adversely affects um, people that live and work and shop and run errands every day, how it impacts their lives. I'd like to look at businesses. How is traffic congestion impacted adversely what they're trying to do. How are they trying to get their employees to work? Are their employees coming to work stressed out? Or um, are goods and services uh, being clogged up and not getting from one point to another? And what is the cost impact to that kind of congestion to the businesses? I'd also look to like potential solutions. Um, again, we're not going to go down the road where a silver bullet approach is going to work. So what are all the pellets of the silver buckshot that's going to all come together and hopefully make a meaningful difference in how we, um, we live and how we get to work and how we shop in here in Hawaii. We want to also look at um, the explicit cost of traffic, as, and what I said to, to not only to the businesses, but um, to the state as a whole. We want to talk to the experts. We want to talk to those folks that are um, in the current discussions of how rail is going to work and how bus is going to interact with it how other pieces of that silver buckshot are going to play in. Um, I've talked to one, folk, uh, one person that said he's having discussions with the rail people about bikes and how, how do we get bikes onto the rails so that when the rail ends, they can take their bike off and, and use that for further mobility. We want to see all the pieces, pieces fit together. So um, for an example, let's, let's, let's assume that the rail now is online and it's going to its second stop. And so it's full of commuters, and they all get off, and they're now at station number two. And then what? Now what do I do? Because my employer is still five miles down the road. And so, yes, the rail got me to this point, but now how do I get to, to my employer? So is it going to be bus? Will there be enough bus routes to come to that rail station and serve it and get you reasonably close to your employer? How many bus routes would that take? How many service hours was that, would that take? Is there road capacity for now a mainstream load of buses to um, serve those rail stations? Or is there a buckshot approach? So we want to explore that as well. Um, some of the excerpts that we got coming on the show, um, not this next week, but the next week after that, I believe that's uh, November 28th, uh, we have the um, Department of Transportation Services uh, Deputy Director. And uh, we would like to talk to him about, you know, bus. How is, how is the bus going to be part of the solution here? Uh, we want to talk about what is called speed and reliability. Um, it's great if you have uh, a schedule in front of you, but if, it's, if the bus is clogged down and it's not making to its destination point, um, is that schedule really that valuable? So we want to talk about speed and reliability and how to improve that. We want to talk about uh, transit. Ridership numbers. Uh, are there opportunities to increase ridership? We want to talk about service hours. Are there enough service hours? What kind of budget would be required to put more service on the road? Um, we know what it feels like when service hours are being cut, but um, how best to apply new service hours? And when the rail does come through, how does that free up service hours for the bus to serve new communities or add frequency improvements to existing communities? We want to interact with rail. Um, we want to see how, again, connectivity will take place, not with just bus, but uh, what about van pools? Uh, what about, um, you know, having carpools also utilize some of these stations? We would definitely want to talk to Hart. We want to talk to the rail people. That's one of my main agendas. I'd like to see how things are going with the construction issues, where we're at with that. Um, it's been in the paper a lot. We'd like to talk to them about... Um, 
the increase of budget, uh, I guess it's 4.68 billion to what a lot of people are very upset about is 8.6 billion. Um, that's a lot of money. As a side note, uh, the city of Seattle just passed a $53 billion rail addition package. So um, as much as I fell off the chair with between a $4 billion and a $6 billion, I feel sorry for my, uh, my former Seattleite friends that are now going to be paying for $53 billion worth of uh, transportation packages. If the rail does stop at Middle Street, exactly how is that going to be served? Uh, again, I made the, the case that if a rail station is at point A, then my employer lives five, my employer lives, my employer works five miles down the road, how am I going to get there? So if, if, if service truly stops at Middle Street, how is it going to be served that people can find and, 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 and obtain that mobility to get them to their ultimate destination? We want to look at planning beyond Middle Street. Where, what, what if more money is obtained? Um, how would that, what would that look like if it's going to Ala Moana Center? What would it look like if, if, if rail service was going to University of Hawaii and Manoa? We want to also talk to, again, those particles of the silver buckshot. We want to talk to the biking community. I think they have a huge role on how we get out of our, you know, how to ease our traffic congestion. But there's things that have to be done. Uh, right now, in Kaka'ako and South Street, they're, they're um, proposing new bike lanes. And I want to talk about safety of bike lanes so people will get used to the idea that maybe it is safe to get on a bike because right now a lot of people won't get on a bike because they don't, they feel, don't feel safe or secure. I'd like to talk about the, what a project called Safe Streets um, and how, how well that's being utilized. I also want to talk about Vampoo and how that, how that could be another addition to our transportation issues. Uh, van pools uh, can carry anywhere from eight to 20 people. And so if you have enough van pools on the road, um, that can make a real dent in some of the congestion issues. <clears throat> it's not easy to form a van pool, but um, maybe there could be policies that are developed that make it easier to get a van pool on the road to begin with. Typically you have to start with eight people, but maybe if there's some um, incentives um, and I'm not saying who would supply those incentives, but maybe you start a van pool with five people and then you graduate to six, seven, and eight so that um, getting a van pool on the road is, is the first step and it's always the hardest step. I'd like to talk to the State of De Department of Transportation. We'd like to know what they're gonna do about um, all their current projects and how that impacting traffic and then talk about future projects. A uh, classic example was the addition not the addition, but it was just the realignment of uh, H1 and, and opening up the HOV lane without any major construction. I think that was a really great thing. And it's, it's moving more people who are taking the option of transit or van pool or carpool. And it's, it's, it's opening up those lanes. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, what is called ATDM. It's called um, Action Traffic and Demand Management. Basically, it's high technology that looks at intersections, and these intersections have the ability to count cars either going through the intersection or cars that are on the um, side streets. And through this technology, what was normally maybe a, a 45 second or a 90 second or a red light now can be short circuited and, and turn green because it's based on traffic flow and traffic counts. So that's a fascinating topic that I think I would love to see more of. I don't know to what extent it is or isn't um, being utilized here in the city. I want to talk to uh, the traffic division of the city and county. Um, talk about smart streets. Talk about their work with the van pool. I understand the van pool is being merged with um, Enterprise. So how well has that worked in the past and how, how, how well can it work in the future? I'd like to talk about um, this thing called the legislature. The fact that the legislature has a big role in, in, in addressing our tra transportation issues. For example, um, a lot of people don't realize, but the federal government says that if you are willing to pay for a transit uh, pass or a van pool pass, that uh, $255 of that each and every month, if it, you know, depending on what it costs, if you don't go over $255, that money is tax free, IRS exempt. And a lot of employers do have programs for you to sign up for, and uh, it will come right off your, your gross pay, and it'd be pre-tax dollars that are set aside in the account 
to being reimbursed for your, your transit passes or your vanfield passes. So that's an example of how government can come up with policies that, that help us out. I'd like to talk about um, transportation benefits above and beyond that. Um, there's one concept that, uh, that I've already briefly talked about is transportation demand management. Well, in some states, they've actually passed, the legislature have passed laws that put a requirement on employers to actually address all the, the employees that are coming into the work site. Um, one in Washington state was called commute trip reduction. And basically what it was is that if you were an employer that employed over 100 people, you had to come up with some sort of plan that your employees could take advantage of, um, whether it was a subsidy for a bus or a subsidy for a van pool or just a, a you know, preferential carpool spot for, for you. It was an idea that the employer now is involved with trying to assist the state and assist the city with uh, some of the transportation issues. I don't think Hawaii is ready for that, but if the traffic gets to a point where it's just stifling economic growth and, and deterring uh, tourists from coming into the state, it might be something that um, we might ask the employer community, if not on a uh, regulatory basis, maybe on a voluntary basis to try to help out. And I think employers are actually doing that now too. I know uh, the city county has on their uh, website um, those employers that are stepping up to the plate and they are buying transit passes. Now, to what, to what extent and to what degree they're buying them, I, I'm not quite certain, but that's a worthwhile discussion. We'd also like to talk about parking management with the city. Um, we know that uh, electric vehicles are giving preferential spots. How about van pool? I, maybe they are, and I just haven't noticed it, but uh, if they are, that's great. If not, then maybe it's time for van pools to get free parking in uh, the, the central cor uh, business core of, of Honolulu. We'd like to talk about what employers could do. Could they, um, again, provide subsidies? Could they provide compressed work weeks and flex time so that people can alter their schedule? So there are a lot of things that this show, I hope we have to, uh, time to address, and it's my hope that we can f basically explore not the silver, silver bullet approach, but we can explore that silver buckshot approach. And it's my hope that um, as each week goes by, our ridership <laughs> goes up in the city, but our, our viewership also increases. So with that, I would like to say thank you for watching the show. We hope you come back again. And if you have any ideas for what you'd like to see on the show, I'm going to give you my email address. It's, my last name's Apicella, A-P-I-C-E-L-L-A, -L -L 58, at gmail.com. And with that, I'm Tim Apicella. This is Hawaii Moving Forward. Thank you very much.